Hey guys, and welcome to Anger of Truth. Tonight we are diving into part three, chapter 13 in the book of Jubilees. But before we get started, tonight I got to mention a couple of things that we missed in part two. So part two was named Yahweh's Promise to Abram. But we didn't really dive into as much of what that promise was as maybe we should have. So I just wanted to bring up a couple of things that I think we should have brought up, but somehow we just passed by it. <laughs> so one of the things that I brought up was the idea that, you know, was, uh, was Lot a righteous man, you know, or was he saved for the benefit of Abraham? And we kind of went back and forth on that a little bit, but we were also questioning the idea was Sodom already this horrible place by the time Lot got there. Would he have been in there in the first place? That sort of thing, right? Well, uh, Sodom was taken over by other kingdoms, so it may not have been quite so bad in the beginning when he was there. Mm. So, so that may not be the case. And also, let's add this. I'm going to start off real quick in verse 19 where it says, Lift up thine eyes from the place where thou, thou art dwelling, northward and southward and westward and eastward, for all the land which thou seest, I shall give to thee and to thy seed forever. And I shall make thy seed as the sand of the sea. Though um, a man may number the dust of the earth, yet thy seed shall not be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, in the breadth of it, and see it all. For to thy seed shall I give it. Okay, so what is this all about? And we kind of mentioned a few things. But what this is, is this promise that he's given him about, you know, your seed is going to do all this stuff. What he's telling him is you're going to be facing some pretty incredible odds here. There's some pretty incredible things that you're going to be confronted with. But this is my promise to you. Fear not. That was the message that the father had given Abram right here in this promise. Look, you see all this? This is going to be yours and the children that you don't even have yet that doesn't exist. They're going to inherit all of this. This is all going to be theirs for generations and generations and generations to come. And there's going to be tons of them. Trust me, you got nothing to worry about. So the father has given him a promise uh, so that he doesn't fear what is what he is going to be facing i just think that's amazing what do you guys amen. think about that amen yeah i mean when you look at the uh, numbers um if if our numbers are correct coming out of egypt at that time those are all from the seed of abraham other than the mixed multitude that went with them but you're looking at uh what could it would they say like could be like a million and a half at least mm -hmm. you know maybe a little bit more than that i mean if if uh, Abraham would have been shown a million, almost two, a million and a half, two million people in front of him, say, hey, this is going to be part of your people going forth uh, later on in you know, this land down the road. I mean, that would probably be like mind blowing in itself. But um, I don't think he fully, I don't, I, well, I can't speak for Abram, of course, but I don't think you can fully grasp at that moment everything that's about to happen in the future. Would you and your seed and everything going forward? Uh, this is an incredible story that only only God can pull this off. <laughs> you know, I was the only one that could pull this thing off. Uh, you know, uh, especially at this point, because we know in the story they have no children and uh, none yet. And um, so that's probably even my, more mind blowing when we read it in the uh, in um, Genesis, and you read the story because even at one point Sarah laughs. <laughs> She's like, she's listening to the conversation. Hey, by the way, a year from now, you're going to be with child. And he, she's in the tent laughing like, oh, really? As old as I am, I'm going to have a child. You know, but she got, she got busted, though. She's like, hey, angels are like, hey, what's she over there laughing about? <laughs> <laughs> she don't believe us? Yeah, I kind of have this, a similar thought there, too, as well, like looking at the um, the land. You know, it's like, I, like how you were saying it would be impossible, almost impossible to see millions of people, you know, like we, I can't even imagine, like I see my two kids and I'm like, okay, you know, how does that turn into that? Well, you can kind of get a glimpse of it a little bit and you can see why the father said, go to the top of this mountain and look all the way around, look 360. He didn't say, okay, just look over there that, you know, that part right, right there in the little valley, that's going to be you in the little village. It's going to be quaint, but it'll be great. And it'll be yours. And you guys will serve the Lord. He's like, no, look that way and that way and that way and that way and that way. Yeah. You're going to have enough people to fill all that up that we're, we're going to, we're going to be 
pretty great here. And so then he's saying, you know, then he went and walked it and then he dwelt there. So he was like, all right, well, I'm establishing this location. I'm essentially planting the flag here and we're going to spread and we're going to grow from this point forward. So it, I think that that helped him at least to may have a little bit of solid to solidify the thought process a little bit of, OK, this is a lot of land and it's just us two right now or, you know, however many people he was traveling with. This might be a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, just a little bit. And he was promised um, a long life that he would die at an old age too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah, that just all of that just lends to this this promise that he's given for him not to fear and what he's going to face. So I just think that was really amazing, and we had to bring that that up before we uh, dove dove into this third part of chapter thirteen. But with that said, Joe, you want to get us started? Absolutely. Let's uh, start off in verse twenty two here, guys. All right, it says, And this year came uh, Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Selassar, and Turgal, king of nations, and slew the king of Gomorrah. And the king of Sodom fled, and many fell through wounds in the vale of Sidom by the salt sea. And they took captive Solomon, Sodom and Adam and Zeboam, and they took captive Lot, also the sons of Abram's, uh, Abram's brother and all his possessions. And they went to Dan and one, who, and one who had escaped came and told Abram that his brother's son had been taken captive and Abram armed his household servants uh, for Abram and for his seed, a 10th of the first fruits of Yahuwah and Yahuwah ordained it as an ordinance forever that they should give it to the priests who served before him that they should possess it for possess it forever. And to this law there is no limit of days, for he hath ordained it for the generations forever, that they should give to Yahuwah the tenth of everything, of the seed, and of the wine, and of the oil, and of the cattle, and of the sheep. And he gave it unto his priest to eat and to drink with joy before him. Well, see, right off the bat here, we've got stuff that, that Abram is to be prepared for. Uh, and it, it tells us, you know, all the people who are being taken mm -hmm. captive, uh, Sodom and Adam and uh, Zeboim, and they took Lot also, the son of Abram's brother, and all his possessions, and they went to Dan, right? So all that stuff happened, and Abram got told about it, and uh, he says, all right, boys, let's go get them. He wasn't, he wasn't worried at all. Let's go, let's, let's go do this. Let's go handle this. Yeah, and it's interesting because he he just got told this like secondhand. It, he didn't see any of this, you know, of his own. This wasn't one of his people that came back and reported. It just said one of the people who escaped came and told Abram. So, you know, I wonder who this, you know, I'm not calling him a spy, but who this, you know, messenger is here that, you know, they are at all this destruction and the kings and people get, getting taken captive and all this all this stuff going on. Yet somebody escapes and, and they went to go tell Abram like at a, was Abram just the guy to tell? Was this somebody who was related to the family who knew about Abram? Like, you know, how many people did this guy go to? You know, that, that was the first thought that came in my head was why was Abram selected as the one who gets to receive this message? Well, we did read prior that he was um, uh, he was kind of honored by the people, right? Yeah, I mean, at this point, Ab Abram's pretty established. I mean, he's not established, established, I guess you could say, yeah, but he is pretty established for, you know, for who he is in the land. Well, but, you know, and, and the reason why I say that is because this land here, we're talking to Sodom and Gomorrah, where he, you know, uh, Abram's kind of looking way off in the distance, like, uh oh, don't go there. You know what's going to happen there. That that's that city's full of sin. They ain't, you know, all this kind of things going on. Abram is not yet. Even I don't I don't think even introduced to this area unless it's just by the the word of Lot you know by the um, testimony so yeah that's, that was the only thing I was wondering yet had he had had he reached that level yet and then if he did were they expecting him to come fight or was he just receiving a message? Well, you know nations nations and kingdoms would be aware of the other nations and kingdoms around them. Um, and they would know whether they are kingdoms that they want to keep peace with or if mm -hmm. they want to try to take over or whatever. Um, and I would say for the type of man that Abram is as a righteous man, right? Um, I would say that he's a very peaceable man, but there must have been something there 
that nobody was thinking about going and infiltrating his land. Right. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, some, I mean, I don't know if well, it's, you know, angels with flaming swords or, you know, or. <laughs> well, or here, what, here's, but, the, here's the thing, too. I think Abram was a man's man. I think he was. Uh, sure. When you read the story in Genesis chapter 14, um, which I'm going to read it for us here in a second, if you don't mind. I'm going to read just, just a small clip of that to kind of fill in here uh, what's going on. It says in Genesis uh, 14. Uh, verse 14, it says, And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Then his servants divided against them by night and struck them and pursued them as far as Hoboth, which is on the left of Damascus. So he brought back all goods and also brought back his brother uh, Lot and his goods and as well as the women and the people. And after his return from striking, the striking of uh, Kedilamir and the sovereigns, the kings who were, were with him, the sovereign of Saddam came out to meet him at the Valley of Shoeth. That is, is that is a sovereign's valley. And so, anyway, what I, what I love about this story is um, 318 guys, trained servants, by the way. <laughs> um, this wasn't talking about trained servants and plowing the fields, trained servants in you know, cutting up the animals and having a barbecue. It says 318 trained servants ready to, I guess they're ready to rock and roll. They've been itching for a while, probably like, yeah, go ahead, bring something on. So the, the, when you go back, if you, if you, I encourage you to go back and study in Genesis, this story, because we have about five kingdoms here that are going from high to low, all this destruction. What's amazing though, and I think we might've brought this up, Jonathan, in the last one that somehow they did bypass, you know, Abram. Now, not that Abram has his kingdom and he's a sovereign, but they're hitting all the all everybody else, and probably maybe they're just like, oh, he's just some guy over over there. We're not going to mess with him. But what I think they found out really quick was that some guy that lives right over there uh, wasn't playing when you mess with his family, and at seventy five years old went to war and took care of business. That's why, to me, when I look at Abram, I think he's a man's man. Seventy five years old, he girded up his loins and said, "Let's go, boys." <laughs> And it says he brought back everything, everybody and everything. He brought it back. He wasn't leaving a crumb anywhere. All right. Yeah. yeah and the biggest difference is, you know, any, anytime you go into battle, you bring God with you. And, you know, he says, I go before you, I defeat your enemies. I lay your path straight. So, yep, you know, right. it, it, there's a huge difference. You can talk about all these battle plans. You can draw up whatever you want. You can attack all the nations and bring them all against like, you know, we're going to read in revelation. But if you bring God with you, then, it's really a non-issue other than you just having the faith that you need to walk it out and he's already gone before you. So. Amen. Right. Amen. I was wondered if the 300 from that story with Abraham related to like the comic book movie series of the movie 300. Cause that's a very specific number and that's a very similar against all odds type of battle. Mm -hmm. So I've always wondered if that was like the original inspiration for, you know, all that, that whole storyline. You know, there's nothing original in in Hollywood, man. They, right, exactly. All, there's so much stuff copied and twisted from scripture; it's unreal. And they're having such a hard time. Even they can't even produce anything new anymore. They just keep revamping old movies. I'm like, that nobody wants to watch. <laughs> <laughs> so before we move on to the next part here, I wanted to bring up um, verse 26. It says, "And to this law, there is no limit of days." forever and this is referring to the 10th mm -hmm. uh, the seed of the wine of the oil the cattle the sheep and um yeah i don't know that i really ever looked at it like this before but this is an example of everything that man has to interact with to produce something else um so like the seed, right? Spreading the seed, cultivating and all that stuff, growing food. So there's your seed, the wine having to, having to be um, picking the grapes, pressing it, mm -hmm. fermentation, the whole process, right? The oil is, you know, there's a process to that, uh, but different from the wine. Uh, the cattle would be, you know, an example of... Um, skins as well as meat things like that and then you have your sheep which is clothing so whether it has to do with food drink um uh, 
good gracious, everything, everything that you put your hands to that has some type of process to it, everything that you put your hands to, there is a portion that is to be given. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have food, clothing, um, light. I, I see pretty much everything represented here. Um, even shelter, you know, the skins can be used as a form of clothing or, mm -hmm. uh, clothing or shelter and, uh, covering warmth yep. as with the sheep. This is the example of what are you doing with the provision that I give you? Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. I'm giving you this provision that all of this is provision. This is what I'm giving you. What are you going to do with it? That's just, yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. And let's not forget too, when we bring our best to Jehovah, you bring your best, you know? Yeah. So it's, you don't, you don't let the, the ugly one, oh yeah, we'll put the ugly one underneath the rod when we're counting out the, <laughs> the sheep and the goats. It's like, no, you know, the Bible says very clear that if you hold your staff out, your rod out, and uh, it was probably more of a staff than a rod. Cause we discussed that before in our tour, uh, our tour group. Uh, the difference in that, but when your rod or staff is out, whatever it is you have, he says, Hey, as you're counting them in and that prize one comes walking underneath, don't stop it. You got to let it keep on going. It's got to give, you know, give, always give back the best. Here's the thing though, with all that God wants to give us the best all the time. Mm -hmm. He doesn't give us chump stuff. He doesn't, you know, <laughs> he doesn't give us the scraps left over. Anytime you read uh, about when they were in the wilderness and they were going anywhere or there or when his people eat uh, or were eating, it always said, and they ate and were satisfied. Not like, yeah, we just got by. Yeah. You know, it was okay. It's like they were, <laughs> they ate and were satisfied. God took care of all their needs, you know? So it's, and that's, that's the thing. And that's, I think as a father, that's all he's wanting back from us. He's like, Hey, don't shortchange me. Give me your best. But guess what? I'm only asking for 10. And I'm going to take that 90 I'm giving you, I'm going to bless it. You know, so it's and not, and this isn't prosperity preaching. So don't get, don't get the wrong idea. If you're watching this for the first time, I don't follow that at, at all. This is God's principles. Mm -hmm. And under his principles, again, what we're seeing here is the priests get to eat. Everyone's taken care of the, award, the widows, the orphans, the sojourners. Everyone is taken care of in God's economy. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when man steps in and he wants to do his own thing is when start, stuff starts going sideways and you know, this doesn't end up so well for everyone else. So, Yeah, so I something know. I wanted to kind of jump in here with is, um, Kyle, earlier you had said that, you know, everything that we put our hands to, everything that, you know, has a process, something that we work, work for or work towards. Well, I think of that as a lot of, you know, the father in creation, you know, when, whenever – He's forming man. He's forming animals. It's something that he would worked toward. It took a process. And when he formed it, like you said, all things were good. He went, well, the things that he created were good. And, and Joe, like you brought it up perfectly, you know, that he, he even more so wants to give us good gifts. He has the best in mind for us and the best intentions for us. He's not asking for us to give all and to give everything. He's asking just to give a portion. But when you look at humanity, you know, he didn't he didn't like Joe, as you called it, you know, chump change. He didn't give us just the leftover and the scraps. You know, he he's like, you know, how do I create these human beings in the best way possible? Well, what what do I start off with? Why don't I make them in my image? Because I'm perfect and I want him. I want these creatures that I'm going to create to be as close to perfect as possible. They're not that they, they're going to be they're never going to be God because that's me. I'm the one and only the almighty. But. I can create something that's very similar and similar in nature. And I'll even give them the desires that I, the same desires that I have. They're going to have the option to choose wrong. I hope they don't, but I'm going to give them my best and I'm going to create them with everything, every option possible to be the best. And when we really kind of view humanity as a, as a whole, when we look in the mirror at the end of the day and we say, man, you know, life's too hard or God made messed up. You know, I wish I did. I wish I wasn't this. I wish I didn't look like that. I wish my life was better here. And then we'd come to realize God spent time forming each one of us. You know, he said he knitted us together in the womb and he made us exactly who we're meant to be. And he, he made us with that perfect image, that perfect mirror in mind of like, Hey, I'm going to make one of these guys, one of these girls kind of like me, kind of like my son. And I have good plans for these guys. And I really hope that they walk this walk and they read these things like, we were talking about the, this this tithe, this 10%. It's a, it's a law forever. 
Mm -hmm. I'm going to write it down and make sure that they don't mess up. I'm going to give them the the rule book. It's like going to elementary school. You know, you got to sit on the little circles or you got to stand in line in the hallway. You know, whatever the, the rules are, we follow those because it's good. It's good order. It's it's the way things work the best. You know, could you send all the kids running down the hallway? Of course, you're going to lose a couple. A couple are you know, going to get hurt, you're, whatever. That's not the best. It works. So we could do things that aren't the best. But why? Why would we make that choice when God gives us all these rules these laws, these statutes, instructions, you know, the, his literal tour, the words from his mouth for us. He said, hey, guys, this is how you optimize this life experience that I'm going to give you. Not only that, look at look at Abram. Look at all these these biblical uh, mm -hmm. story characters. Um, not that it's story isn't fake, but, you know, the, the story of the scripture and look at their life. Look at Abram and his couple hundred dudes go and handle business because mm -hmm. I went before them. Look at everybody else going to this land with giants because I went before them. Do you not understand that I'm sending you there with victory already in mind? I'm sending right. you there with success already set up for you. This land, it, it's done. You showed up. They already built the roads. They built the houses. They plowed the fields. You just have to show up, and you just get to enjoy living in the creation that I formed for you. So I just, one, love the, trying to really, really break down some of those thoughts and concepts of what the Father has intended for us. And, you know, day one of creation, when he's first forming sun and earth and waters and all stuff, he's thinking, I'm going to create these guys and these girls. It's going to be pretty cool. And I'm going to make them just like me. And let's see how this plays out, you know, I, with every good intention possible. Yeah. And the other thing that I was thinking is when we look at these verses 25 and 26, it's talking about very early there. It says, for Abram and his. For Abram and for his seed, a tenth of the first fruits to Yahuwah. So we get that word first fruits and we kind of think, oh, okay, the first of stuff, right? You know, like if you make some money, give him the first of the money. If you get a couple sheep, give him the first of the sheep. But there's a there's a little bit of a definition that we're going to get as we get into um, 26 where it talks about the, um, the tenth of the oil, the wine, the cattle, the sheep, and the, the seed. So now we're kind of understanding something a little bit different because this is giving us very, very early indicators of what supposedly we're not going to get until Moses. But we're getting it now about the feast and festivals. So we're going to have three first fruits on our on our biblical calendar when you have the, the, the oil, the wine and the bread. And so now as we're looking at it. God's already instilling and installing, not that it just now is showing up. It's has been happening this whole time, but he's making it even more clear. He's making it even more firm. He's like, I want the best of these. I want your tent, but these things are going to be a part of your feast and festival. These are, these are part of your calendar. This is going to be a part of your every year cycle. That's why he says it's, these laws are forever. Every year you're going to have new wine. Yeah, we're going to have a feast for that. Every year we're going to have bread when we get the first barley harvest. Yeah, we're going to have a feast for that. Every year we're going to do the oil. We're going to have a feast for that. And these are going to be things that you're going to help to keep your schedule. It's going to be things that you're going to be able to interact with me. Kyle, like you said it perfectly, each one of these have a process. Each one of these have a purpose and an intent behind it. And the father's like, I know. And these are going to be staples in your life. So guess what else is going to be a staple in their life now? Worshiping the father, honoring the father. There's not going to be a year that goes by that they're going to say, yeah, this year, you know, we didn't eat. No, they're going to eat and they're going to have to honor the father when they do it. And they're going to have a meal with them and they're going to be in that uh, communion and they're going to build community around that. The father's going to be the center point of their community all around. So I just love that he's instilling that, that he's showing Abram and Abram's following through with all of it from, you know, day one Genesis or day one Jubilees all the way through. We're going to see into the end times of Revelation. You know, Amen. I want to say this too, as a man who loves to eat, <laughs> okay, uh, what I love about this is is almost uh, pretty much everything that's centered around our, our Heavenly Father is around food. Hmm? You know, from the time in the temple or the tabernacle when they're, you know, I call it a gigantic barbecue going on because this is what, this is what they have. This is their provisions for Levi for them to eat. You know, and because right here in 27, Kyle, you'll bring it up for me, sir. I love this. And it says in 27, uh, says um, Jonathan hit on 25 and 26. It says, then he gave it unto his priest to eat, to drink with joy mm -hmm. before him. Yep. So, you know, people, people can say, oh, you serve a cruel God. You serve a hateful, vengeful God. You serve blah, blah, blah. 
No, we serve a God who loves family. We serve a God who loves to give his best. We serve a God that says, hey, by the way, you priests, when, when you're doing these things, and though you're not getting any land, you're not getting this inheritance, but I don't worry because I'm going to take care of you. As there, if everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing, just like it, right here it says, and he gave it unto his priest to eat, to drink with joy before him. But Joe, Hallelujah. I thought this Old Testament stuff was bondage. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of people, I think if, if people really understood when they say, oh, well, Christ nailed everything to the cross, all that, yada, yada. I think if they really understood the feast days and how these are like, these are actually good, man. Like they talk about, oh, get a week off from everything, go Sukkot, go camping, have barbecues, you know, do all the stuff that we do, the fellowship, just all the things that are involved in that. Um, I find no bondage in that whatsoever. <laughs> Uh, we love the campfire stories. Everything that goes on during Sukkot is, is a blessing. And I think that's when the Heavenly Father looks down and goes, that's what I meant it for. That's what I wanted it for, is for you guys to get together and for my children to get together. And, and of course, we're, we're he's there. We're bringing him. He's bringing us. It's like we're all there as uh, one big family. So it's, it's an amazing. And I think that's where when someone who doesn't understand these things Think, oh, well, he just did away with all that. And those are also binding and burdensome, and we're no longer under the law, yada, yada. I'm like, hey, man, Pesach, eating. Uh, all of them, I just go through all the feast days. There's there's eating involved in all of them. <laughs> you know, one of them is a little bit of fasting, if that's what you want to do, or if that's what you feel like it's telling you to do. But other than that, hey, man, it's all like Donkey Kong, brother. And uh, we <laughs> serve a good God. I'm just, that's all I'm going to say about that. And so uh, we need, I mean, obviously we don't need to like veer the conversation off of that, off of where we're at too much, but I, I got to say this, man, Eve used to get so upset with me because we would share, we would share the, uh, the, the feasts, you know, with our friends and our family or whatever. And I had, I, I used the way I always phrased it. I would, I would tell him, I'd be like, God's a partier, man. I said, he wants to party with us. And she would just, Oh, she would get so frustrated with me, and on a but that was the way I would explain it to him. I'm like, like think about it, guys. You know, think about all the holidays you have in the system that you keep right now. Mm -hmm. You got what? We got we got we got Valentine's, we got St. Patty's, we got uh, Easter, Hall yeah. Easter, right? Uh, Halloween, if you keep that. Um, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, Christmas. Christmas. New Year's, New Year's and, and, yeah. and I'll go ahead and give you an extra day, an extra day for Christmas. So you can say New Year's Eve too, right? Mm -hmm. That's eight days out of the year. That's eight days. Mm -hmm. That's one festival. <laughs> yeah. And then we got a bunch more. <laughs> yeah. Not counting every weekend. Mm -hmm. Every Shabbat, he wants to party with us, right? He wants to, he wants to. He wants to be with his kids. He wants to be with his kids. He wants to sit down. He wants to have dinner. But yeah, my wife, she was never, <laughs> never fond of that. <laughs> he wants to party with us. <laughs> oh boy. That's awesome. All right, guys, let's jump back into it in verse 28. And it says that the king of Saddam came to him and bowed himself before him and said, our Lord Abram, give unto us the souls which thou hast rescued, but let the booty be thine. And Abram said unto him, I lift up my hands to the most high Elohim, that from a thread to a shoe lat lat latchet, I shall not take aught that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich, save only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me, Aner, Eskel, and Mamre, these will take their portion. And so, guys, what I like to like to just go into this one with is I love the fact that Abram has this wisdom given to him. Uh, when we read in Genesis the account with Melchizedek, um, you know that's who showed up. And then uh, right on the side, right there, Kyle, would you mind reading that about um, uh, Melchizedek that he's put in, you know, on the left side, sir? Please. Okay, um, Melchizedek, as Shem is not supported, as he has no beginning and no end, according to Hebrews. Additionally, what scholar would actually say Abraham tithe to his oldest son, Shem? It's not logical. And then down below that, it says the law about tithes is made to apply for the Levitical priesthood. There we go. So what I want to point out in here is that when we go, we're going to talk about the, the king of Sodom here in just a moment. But I want to go back to Melchizedek just for a second. Um, and unfortunately, for whatever reason, I think 
it does say something there about this part was probably in there, but the, I guess it was lost uh, in translation at some point where the whole story is not there. But you see that when he when when Melchizedek shows up, the king of um, Salem, in that in the past we've been taught that this was Shem. When we look at the timelines, and I believe these are these are derived from the Masoretic text, that it would have had Shem living all the way up until the time of probably Isaac or something like that. Uh, but when we go back and we and we look through the Septuagint, we look. I think the Septuagint kind of brings those timelines back into a proper place. And so when we look at this, that's something that I'm glad that we read that and kind of pointed out that um, Shem's not alive here. Shem would have already died. Um, and that we don't really know who. We can speculate that this is Yeshua. We can say that that's, this is Yeshua showing up as the king of, um, of Salem. But we don't really know who it is. But all we know is this is, a, this is the priesthood that Yeshua is now taking the mantle of when he rose from the grave. To ascend to his father and to the place of the order of Melchizedek. So there is something very significant here that this is placed, you know, and this is this is about if I don't know, guys, help me out here, but I don't think there's a whole lot other than when we go to Hebrews in the New Testament, I don't think there's a whole lot more said about the king of um uh Salem here, you know, Melchizedek. We get like this little snapshot, and that's pretty much it. So it's up to it's left up to speculation who this person is and and who they actually you know where they're from and all that stuff. But we really don't know when the when it's all said and done if this is Yeshua showing up or anything like that. Um, but all we know is that Abram recognized who he was. And that's what was important. So when this guy showed up, I'm like, like, well, who's you? <laughs> who are you? <laughs> you know, Abraham recognized it to the point Abraham was already given this given over a tenth of everything that he's guys like he uh, he. This was an understanding that he already knew. And I believe this is, this is from chapters earlier when we were reading, when Abram, Abram was sat down with the angel and he was taught the ancient language mm -hmm. and, and the language was given to his mouth to speak. I believe the priesthood and everything. That's why he recognizes who this person is when he shows up. He's like, oh, I know exactly who you are. And I know exactly what to do with what I have because this is something that God has downloaded to me through the angel that I'm going to give a tenth of what I have back to Yahuwah. So anyway, I love that part of the story. I love the fact that Abraham, he's, he knows what he's doing. He's doing the right thing. And then all of a sudden we get the king of Sodom, the king of Sodom showing up. And then what does he want to do? He wants to make a deal. He's like, hey, Abraham, hey, you give me this. I give you this. And Abraham's like, uh, Abraham's like, mm -mm -mm. he's like, I know where my help comes from. You know, like we talked about earlier, Jonathan, with the whole 318 guys, you know, and, and how uh, these are trained men and that this is something. And he not only went into battle with the 318, but God went with him into the battle. Abram recognizes, I know where my sustenance comes from. I know where my blessings come from. And by the way, uh, King of Sodom, you're not getting any glory in this. You will never, ever say, oh, see that guy living on the other side of the valley over there? Yeah, I made him rich. You will never, ever be able to take that glory and that honor from my, my father. I think it's a, the wisdom, everything he's doing here is spot on. I think it's amazing. And guys, we're going to post a link down in the description below. So if you have some questions about that or if that, if you're, if that doesn't quite click with you, it's not making sense about the timeline and uh, their age and who lived when and all that when it comes to Shem and Abram and all that. We're going to leave a video link down in the description below that will hopefully clear up some things for you, especially when it comes to the Masoretic versus Septuagint translations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when we're going to be digging through those different timelines of Septuagint versus the Masoretic, it definitely lends for some more interesting conversations and, and for us always to dig deeper into Scripture. And one of my favorite things about digging deeper into Scripture is really seeing who the father is and really seeing that the promises that he's put forth from day one of creation all the way up until this point now. And obviously we know further in the future, but you know, we're studying along the way here with you guys. So here in Abram's life, you know, we're going to see things that are uh, being spoken over him about his seed and, and uh, his, the people are going to be like never even numbered They're like the dust of the, the earth and the sands of the sea. We're going to see stand on top of this mountain and look left, right down up, you know, behind you, in front of you, all of this stuff is going to be 
what your um, future generations are going to inhabit. But one of the cool things that I, one of my favorite things actually about scripture that says you, you will be the head and never the tail. And when we look at that, we're going to read in 28 and it says, and the king of Sodom came to him and bowed himself before him. And it's not about Abram getting the glory here. It's not about Abram's pride and his ego getting a pat on the back. It's about Abram turns around and, and we can see his heart from the pr previous verses. He just finished giving a ten tenth of everything that he just had, all his spoils and everything. He's saying, mm -hmm. it's not about me. How do I serve God in the way that he's asked me? Let's do these feasts and festivals. Let's make sure I'm giving my 10 percent. And this is what put him in the position to be the head and not the tail. These aren't promises that are given flippantly of you can do whatever you want in life and live however you want. And you'll always remain the head. It's actually yeah. the opposite. We'll see, you know, the God's chosen people being taken into captivity many times for not acting accordingly. And that those times, those promises don't come through the way that they look like here for Abram. So I just challenge you guys, you know, always look into scriptures and look to those promises and understand that those are real promises. And God has goals and expectations and things to have for us to keep that relationship strong to stay in unity with him and our brothers and sisters around us. And let's just remember, God called us to be the head, not the tail. Amen. Amen. And with that, guys, we will see you next time for chapter 14 in the book of Jubilees. God bless. Ciao. Shalom. It's almost like uh, all that stuff going on around him. It's almost like there was always somebody there saying, these are not the righteous men you're looking for. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Corner, we want on them, huh? <laughs> <laughs> these, oh, are not, these, these are not the Hebrews you're looking for. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, what you need to do is in, in the corner, put put a little counter and yeah. <laughs> microphone bump counter, and it just blink, blink, and it just keeps going up and up and up as. <laughs> <laughs>